John 18 is where we are. If you're new to Loft, um, we love to go through books of the Bible and passage by passage and just study scripture. And um, in God's sweet providence and kindness, um, we are in the passion story over the next several weeks leading up to Easter. And it worked out well with the timing of um, our study. And so we're looking at John 18, where Jesus has now been arrested. If you were here last week, we looked at how Jesus was arrested um, in the middle of the night. He was betrayed by Judas, his friend, his disciple, and now he is being led. And this morning, we're going to see a courtroom scene, but it's not a just courtroom scene. It's a scene of incredible injustice where we see an innocent man being condemned to die. And so John 18, we're going to be at verses 12, and we'll go all the way down to verse 32. And um, this is going to be a little bit different, where normally I'll give you um, points from the text, but I just want to like read the passage, give you some highlights, and point some stuff out to you from this text, and then we'll go from there. We've all seen films or shows with courtroom scenes, right? Legal dramas like um, Blue Bloods or... Law and Order, or you name the movie that you like, My Cousin Vinny, or A Few Good Men. Courtroom dramas can be dramatic, they can be demonstrative, they can be intense, they can be iconic, they can be moving, they can be mournful. All of us have a desire to see justice served. We want to see the bad guy go down, we want to see the innocent go free. But in the courtroom that we're about to step into today is not one that's full of justice but one that's full of injustice. Not one full of righteousness, but one full of unrighteousness. Not one of impartiality, but one of partiality. We'll see a kangaroo court that the religious leaders and the politicians of that day drag Jesus through. Now, there are two main sets of trials for Jesus in our text. There's the trial before the Jews, the Jewish leaders, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, And then there's a trial before the Roman leaders. Each trial had several parts. In Luke 22, and I'm going to crisscross back between the different Gospels so we could get the full picture here. In Luke 22, we see the Jewish trials. These trials take place during the daytime, which quickly lead to the Roman trials. And in our text, Jesus goes through some initial, almost interviews or pre-trials before... um, who was the former high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest. Right, so we see this trial between Annas, uh, this conversation between Jesus and Annas, the former high priest, and Caiaphas, the current high priest. And in fact, by the time we're done, we'll see six different trials that Jesus goes through. There's the one before Annas, and then Caiaphas, and the assembly of the Grand Sanhedrin, then the Pilate, then Herod, and then eventually back to Pilate where Jesus is condemned to die. There are three stages in the Jewish court, three stages in the Roman court. And all of this took place in about a six-hour time span and concludes with the crucifixion of Jesus. And so for us to be able to understand this text a little bit, I've got to give you a little bit of background here in understanding how Hebrew law functioned back in that day. Hebrew law was arguably the most just and the fair system in the history of the world. The Sanhedrin took only the capital cases. They had 71 Jewish men on the court, 23 priests, 23 scribes, 23 elders of the city, and two officers. Each of them had to be full-bodied Jewish men. They had to have legal experience and had to be experts in linguistics because no Gentile was allowed for translating. Finally, they had to withdraw themselves if they were in any way, shape, or form connected personally to the person involved. The role of the witnesses was extremely important back then, more so than even in our own Jewish system today, in our own criminal system today. There had to be at least two witnesses of the crime, and their stories had to match up identically. If they lied, the witnesses, they were subjected to that penalty. And there were no prosecutors in Jewish law. The witnesses served as that. They were asked many, many questions, and if they disagreed, even in the slightest bit, the case was thrown out, and the person was declared innocent. The accused was always presumed innocent until proven guilty. The judges who presided over the hearing, like Annas and Caiaphas, were not to condemn the accused, but to defend them. 
They couldn't try to sway them to confess at all. And then each of the 71 were defendants with 60% of the vote needed to be able to find them guilty. And if it was unanimous, the case was thrown out because it was an emotional decision. If guilty, they wouldn't even sentence the person for that entire day, but they would vote again the next day to make sure they voted right. No trials were supposed to take place at night, but in the day before God and man. And if the trial was running late and approaching dusk, it would be recessed until the next day. The whole process made it extremely rare for a person to be condemned to die. The Jewish old law book says that one capital punishment in seven years was considered a criminal slaughterhouse. That is the Hebrew law in a nutshell when it comes to capital offenses. But as we look at the trial of Jesus that we discover in John 18 and 19, we see something completely different. The entire system implodes because of the pride, the arrogance, the selfishness of man. And you can see Satan at work behind the scenes here. And I want us to walk through the trial of Jesus that takes place. And I want you to notice who comes to Jesus' defense. I want you to see the threads of injustice that takes place. And finally, I want you to see the dramatic turn of events at the end of the chapter. It's a fascinating exchange that takes place here. Look with me at verse 12. In the company of soldiers, the commander and the Jewish temple priest, police arrested Jesus and tied him up. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was advantageous for the one man to die for the people. If you remember the scene from last week, they're outside of the walls of the Garden of Gethsemane. All the disciples have fled Jesus now, except for Peter and John, who seem to lurk in the dark, following the mob and following Jesus to find out what happened. And then we see the troops with Jesus and Judas slither across the Kidron Valley, up the hill, past the walls of the temple. Jesus' hands are tied with a rope, and they lead him up the hill with nearly 600 soldiers surrounding him leading this peasant Jewish man from Nazareth to the courts of justice to be served. The Sanhedrin, no doubt, was running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Everything was happening way too fast, but they had to take advantage of the moment that was presented to them. They had tried to arrest Jesus on numerous occasions in the past, but they failed. But this time they had an advantage because they had an inside man. Judas began to work for them. And they were trying to pull themselves together and look professional and calm and collected. They were scrambling for witnesses who would have possibly caught Jesus saying something incorrect. You can see them adorning themselves with layers of fancy clothing, with rings that are shimmering and the sound of clanging bells as they're running around trying to get everything set to condemn Jesus. They were dressed to kill, literally. And the first person the guards take Jesus to is a man by the name of Annas. Only the Gospel of John records this scene. Annas, we need to know, is a notorious character. You can almost say that he was the head of the the Jewish mafia. He was like the godfather of the Jewish mafia. His family was immensely rich, and one by one, they bribed their way into the chief high priest's role. Five of his sons have already been chief high priest, and now Caiaphas, his son-in-law, was the current high priest. The family controlled the whole town, and while his sons reigned as high priest, behind the scenes was Annas, the godfather, dictating what to do. Make him an offer they can't refuse, right? Um, Man, nobody got that. So sad. (laughs) You guys need to watch The Godfather. It's a classic. It is good. Um, And Annas made his money by ripping people off especially in the courts of the Gentiles in the temple during the feasts and festivals. You remember the story where Jesus overturns the tables? Annas was in charge of all of that. Money changers would charge like a 12% fee, which was in that day a day's wages, so that people could make sacrifices that they were required to do. Not only that, but Annas would put inspectors inside the temple. And these inspectors... Whenever a foreigner would come in with animals that they brought in from their home country, he would immediately cause them to reject it. 
thus causing them to go back into the courts and buying animals from the temple courts, which was hijacked about 20% simply so they can make money. It's like paying $5 for something that like actually costs a dollar or maybe a quarter. Think Starbucks for a second, right? <laughs> now, remember Jesus went Indiana Jones on these guys earlier. And Jesus hit Annas where it hurt hard, his money. And Annas weren't the first shot at Jesus. Look at verse 15. And he, Jesus, John, the writer, goes back and forth between a scene in the courts with Jesus and then with Peter on the outside. So we're going to see him going back and forth here. And so now, verse 15, Meanwhile, Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. And so he went in with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter remained standing outside by the door. And so the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper, and they brought Peter in. So here we find Peter and John following Jesus at a distance. John got to go in because he had some connections with the Jewish mafia here, apparently. And so he was able to go in, and Peter had to stand outside, but still within sight of Jesus. And the place they entered was a big courtyard area, basically the front yard of Annas' house. Go down to verse 17. And the slave girl, who was the doorkeeper, said to Peter, You aren't one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not, he said. And now the slaves and the temple police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing there warming themselves, and Peter was standing with them warming himself. And so the girl as Peter was walking through the gate, took notice of Peter. Remember, in Peter's mind, he's the guy who tried to create an insurrection and tried to destroy the Roman armed soldiers, and all he got was a year of one of the servants, not even a soldier, right? And so his blood pressure is rising. He's afraid he's going to get caught and killed. The other Gospels indicate that this was a prolonged exchange of words between Peter and the servant girl, and, but Peter assures her, listen, you've got the wrong guy. You, he looks like me, but that's not me. And so Matthew indicates that Peter not only denied he knew Jesus, but made sure everyone around the fire knew as well. And so we find him trying to blend in, trying to hide, standing with others, warming himself by the fire, but he wants to know what's going on with Jesus. Verse 19, the high priest questioned Jesus and his disciples and about his teaching. Verse 20, I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus answered him. I've always taught in the synagogue and the temple complex where all the Jews congregate, and I haven't spoken anything in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who've heard what I told them. Look, they know what I've said. And so John, our writer, goes back. So John, we're at verse 19 to 21. John goes back to Jesus in front of Annas. And Annas first asked Jesus about his disciples. He's like, where are your folks? Are they about to create an insurrection? What's going to go on here? Would Jesus' followers buck the system and create an uproar because Jesus was arrested? And then he begins to ask Jesus about the things that Jesus taught. They were very concerned about the theological things, but when they stand before Pilate, they present everything that's political. Annas was desperately trying to get Jesus to implicate himself, and that was against the law. That wasn't what the chief priest was supposed to do. And Jesus responds that they already know what he's been teaching because everything that he taught, he taught in public. Paul, before Festus in Acts 26, would say that Jesus, what he did was didn't do something in the corner behind the scenes, but he was, in a way, preaching so that everyone would know. And he says, why don't you ask the crowds what I taught? Ask the people around me what I taught. The case had to rest on the weight of the testimony of other people. And Jesus is simply saying, hey, find some witnesses. Ask them what I taught you. Hear from them what I've said and see if I've said anything wrong. Verse 22, when he said these things, one of the temple police standing by him slapped Jesus, saying, Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, Jesus answered him, Give evidence about the wrong, but if rightly, why did you hit me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And so now, no doubt the soldiers, probably angry at Jesus because he knocked them down that previous week, last week's sermon, he just knocked them out. They're now mad at Jesus, and they're just looking at a chance to get back at Jesus, right? And so this soldier punches Jesus, most likely in the face, breaks his nose, probably just, probably even at the nod of Annas the priest. 
He was probably hoping that this would get Jesus angry and then give him something to accuse Jesus of. The other Gospels say that they also spit on Jesus' face. They punched him multiple times while they covered his head with a cloth, mocking him, asking him to prophesy which of them hit him. All of this in view of Peter, the disciple. No doubt blood is running from his face, running down his nose, which is most likely broken at this point. And Jesus looks up and says, what have I done wrong that you would punch me? If I spoke the truth, why do you assault me? He is in a sense, unmasking their deceit, and they're so frustrated in their pride that they resort to violence. Now the Annas, the high priest, is frustrated, so he sends Jesus bound and beaten and bloody to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, which most likely was right next door on the other side of the courtyard. And even though John doesn't record the trial here, we find in the other Gospels that Caiaphas had witnesses ready to try Jesus, but they couldn't seem to get their story straight. Jesus said he literally destroyed the temple, one of them said. And then someone else comes back and says, no, that's not what he said. He said, I'll rebuild the temple in three days. We learn that Caiaphas gets so frustrated that he asks Jesus if he's God, and he was desperate to find anything, and Jesus says, yes, and even uses the phrase that we've heard this morning, I am. I am. And in response, Caiaphas tore his clothes The problem was that the high priest wasn't allowed to tear their clothes. This was something that was forbidden in Leviticus. You'll see that they cared nothing about the law or for justice at all. And the most shocking thing is no one was allowed to defend Jesus, and no one seemingly cared forward, seemed interested in coming forward to defend him. Clearly, John didn't. Peter didn't. There was never any evidence that said that Jesus was guilty. Luke 22 records that they again beat him and mocked him some form. Friends, this entire arrest was illegal. It was done at night. It was achieved through a traitor. It was done without witnesses established. And then the trial before Annas was illegal. Again, it was done by night. It was done by a single judge. It was Jesus being pushed to indict himself. And then the trial before Caiaphas was illegal. It was again done at night. It was the day before the Jewish Sabbath. It was completed in a 24-hour period. It was secured the conviction on the defendant's own testimony, and it concluded with a unanimous verdict. This was a mockery of justice, the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the world. If this happened to Jesus, as he said, we should expect it should happen to us. Be prepared to suffer for injustice. That doesn't mean that you don't pursue legal means given to you, but it does mean that you resist your own vengeance. Let God take care of that. In our world of hair-trigger responses and vengeances for acts of injustice, we need to remember this. And this is especially true for those of us who want to air all of our opinions on social media and weigh in on everything you feel is unjust in the world. We need to remember that judgment is coming. The cross tells us that justice is coming. God the Father is not going to leave God the Son as a hunk of meat on a cross. The story doesn't end that way. It ends with resurrection and ascension and a glorious return of our Savior. All the injustices done to you will be paid for by the person or by Jesus for them. All the injustices you've done will be paid for by you or by Jesus on your behalf. Without the cross, injustice would be impossible to deal with. Friends, Christianity is the only faith that says that God himself was a victim of injustice. Jesus was lynched by an angry mob, my friends, and we can deal with a little injustice in this life because we serve a Savior who suffered so much more for you and I. Look at verse 25. Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, you aren't one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, and he said, I am not. I want you to notice the dramatic contrast here. Jesus stands up to his questions, and he doesn't deny anything, but Peter cowers before his questioners and denies everything. And as Jesus exits the place of Annas, we see Peter standing at the fire, rubbing his hands together and spreading them over the fire. And Jesus would pass right by Peter on the way out. 
Some of the soldiers, maybe the ones leading Jesus, caught Peter's eye and said, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter flat out denies it. And more than likely, Jesus was walking right by him with blood flowing down his face. Verse 26. One of the high priest's slaves, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, did I see you with him in the garden? And Peter again denied it. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Another soldier passes by. But this one is kind of interesting. Malchus's cousin recalls how his cousin had lost a year to this fellow, and he points to Peter. The other Gospels tells us that a lot of the soldiers began to start accusing Peter. Sweat is now pouring down the face of Peter on this cold, dark night. His heart is racing. Everyone is pointing fingers. And so Peter begins to yell out and invoke curses on himself to deny Jesus and save his own life. And you can hear everyone get quiet. Peter again denies Jesus, and everyone watches, including Jesus. Luke 22 says that at that moment, Jesus turned, and he looked at Peter. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life, not a lot, but I will get a stare from my wife, and she doesn't need to even say a word but I know I've done something wrong, right? You married men, folk, you married men know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And you know there's some making up to do. There's some work that you need to do. But I feel like the look that Jesus gives Peter isn't the same one that I'll occasionally get from my wife. I think there's a genuineness, sadness in Jesus' eyes as he sees his friend deny him in front of others. No doubt one of his eyes is swollen shut from all the beatings he received. The other eye blinking with blood, dropping, running down mucus from the soldiers, dripping off of his brow. Peter's heart breaks as the rooster crows, just as Jesus said it would. Now all of a sudden, Peter is full of guilt and shame. And scripture says that Peter ran into the night. No destination. He just runs. The Gospel of Luke says that Peter wept, and the word for weeping there is if someone had died. Peter is coming apart at the seams. You can see his brokenness. Everyone left Jesus. His closest friends have abandoned him. No one defending him or coming to his rescue. I want you to notice the slippery slope of sin in our lives, in the life of Peter. Because, friends, you and I, we are Peter. Peter told just one little lie to a little girl, but it led to a complete denial of Jesus, really to the face of Jesus. Friends, if you just crack the door a little bit and think a little sin will not hurt you, you're mistaken. You're mistaken. Can I admonish you? Can I pastor you for a second and say, don't play with fire? You say, hey, this doesn't hurt anyone. It's just me by myself. A little sin will eventually become a big sin. A little compromise will lead to a greater compromise. What led to Peter's fall? First of all, it was pride and presumption. Peter's like, I'll never deny you. I'll never reject you. Even if everyone else runs away from you, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give up on you. He said he'll never fail Jesus. Peter was self-deceived. He didn't think that he was capable of serious failure or sin at this level. You know, David probably had very similar thoughts when he was tempted in front of Bathsheba. Friends, inside of our hearts is the ability to commit the most heinous and dreadful of sins. My friends, we need to know that we're not above anything and the moment you think you are is the moment that you are most vulnerable. Be honest. Keep a short account of sin. You know the verse in Corinthians. Be careful lest you think you stand. Take heed lest you fall. Second thing, Peter didn't think he needed to pray. He thought he was okay. Jesus in the garden three times said, hey, just pray with me for a little bit. Spend some time praying with me. But Peter's like, I'm okay. I'm fine. 
I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I can pray later. I can do spiritual stuff later. I can follow Jesus later. I can read Scripture later. He was more committed to his physical needs than he was to his spiritual needs. And so when the enemy began to attack, Peter wasn't ready for it. If you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. As much as you try to take care of your physical bodies, make sure you take, of your, take care of your soul even more. Make sure that you are in the Word. Make sure you are pursuing Jesus because the enemy is seeking to devour and destroy you. But if you are in Jesus, you will be able to stand. Third thing, Peter was preoccupied with his own safety more than pursuing Jesus. He cared more about saving face than he did about owning up his lo- to his loyalty to Jesus. Friends, you can't conceal your identity as a follower of Jesus and expect to thrive and withstand temptation. Peter needed to publicly align with Jesus and take whatever consequences came with that. That's part of why Jesus told his followers that, hey, you need to be publicly baptized so that the world will know that you belong to me. Have you been publicly identified with Jesus before the church and before the world? Do people know that you belong to Jesus, that you follow Jesus? Are you connected to the life of a local church? And I can picture Peter here running in the darkness, presuming ministry with Jesus is over, that Jesus is done with him. If you have your Bible, slip over to Luke, Mark 16. I just want to see one passage. Mark 16, verses 5 through 7. It says, when they entered the tomb, this is after the resurrection, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified, but he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. Look at verse 7. Go, tell the disciples and Peter. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Why does the angel single out Peter? Did Peter finally mess up to the point that Jesus would say, hey, you're no longer one of the disciples? Did Peter mess up to the point that he had to prove himself before Jesus could use him again? I haven't found a lot of good commentaries to explain why Peter is singled out here, so... I'm going to give you what I think personally. This is my own commentary. You can take it or leave it. But there's something here about Peter being singled out that should encourage each and every one of us that have failed in front of our Savior. Because I believe in those moments that we have failed and think that we can never be used by God. In those moments, God doesn't just lump us in with the rest of the people around us. And he doesn't just put a label on us like everyone else is labeling us. In those moments and when we think that we are our lowest, you should hear your Savior calling you by name. You should hear him say, tell Sam I'm not done with him. Tell Sam I'm not finished with him. In those moments when you have failed, in those moments where you think that God can never use you again, in those moments when you think that you have messed up one too many times, would you hear the Savior say your name? Can you imagine if the angels had said, hey, go tell my disciples, and the women went and ran to the disciples and said, hey, Jesus wants to see you, and Peter like, you know what, I messed up. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. You guys go ahead. I'm going to stay here. But can you imagine the excitement on his face when the women said, Peter, he called you by name. Peter, he called you. He wants to see you. He's not done with you yet, Peter. He's not finished with you yet, Peter. He's still got a plan and purpose for you, Peter. Why don't you? He, he's, got, he's got some good things he wants to do, do through your life, Peter. And that's why Scripture says that Peter got up as quickly as possible, ran as fast as he could to the tomb because he heard the Savior call him by name. Friends, if you feel like God can't use you, you need to know that he knows you by name. And in those moments where you fail, 
he will make sure that you are reminded of that. Fifty days later, less than two months after his absolute failure, Peter stands in front of a crowd and in Acts 2 where everyone knew he was loved and followed and followed Jesus. You say, how did that happen? Peter had to learn a valuable lesson that we who know and love Jesus have to internalize, that Peter's security in Jesus and Jesus' love for Peter was not wrapped up in Peter's faithfulness to Jesus, but it was wrapped up in Jesus' faithfulness to Peter. This is how Peter could return. This is how Peter could be used again. It was the gospel that helped Peter get off the floor and run back hard to Jesus. He knew that Jesus wasn't standing there with a two-by-four ready to knock him in the head for his failure. He knew that Jesus wasn't done with him. One of the most encouraging things about the whole scene is that Jesus doesn't publicly rebuke Peter on the spot. It was the love and the grace of Jesus for Peter that got Peter back off. Friends, you are never too far gone from grace that grace can't find you and transform you. No matter how far down the rabbit hole you've fallen, I assure you, you haven't as fallen as far deep as Peter fell. And as a follower of Jesus, you don't have to clean yourself up or work yourself back up to get into good standing with Jesus. You just need to turn and look and see the Savior. He is not somewhere over there looking to judge you or condemn you on the other side and saying, I can't do anything with you. But he is there with you in the midst of it, and he is calling you by name. He has never left you. He has never given up on you. He is still ready to use you. C.S. Lewis once said, but the great thing to remember is that even though our feelings will come and go, His love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in the determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to him. Go back to verse 28, John 18. When they took Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters, it was early morning, but they wouldn't enter the headquarters themselves Otherwise, they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. Look at the hypocrisy here. The religious leaders spent all night at Annas' house trying to find guilt with Jesus, but they couldn't. And so they took him to Caiaphas' house and then to Pilate's court. Jesus bloodied and beaten. But notice their hypocrisy. They had just committed a massive injustice by dragging Jesus into court at night, making false accusations, beating him unjustly. And now they're concerned about entering into Pilate's court, lest they'd be unclean and not be able to eat dinner that night. They were blinded by their own sin. They missed the forest for the trees. They saw the Bible as being about them and what they needed to do in keeping the law when it's really about Jesus and what he was going to do for them. Verse 29, but Pilate came out to him and said, what charge do you bring out against this man? And they apparently went to this man, Pilate, thinking that they could dupe him into killing Jesus for them, saving their political hides with the community. It was about 5 a.m. when all of this happened. Pilate is probably not a happy camper that he was awoken so early in the morning that a mob is showing up at his door. What do we know about this man named Pilate? He was a Roman governor who was a morally weak man who tried to hide his flaws with stubbornness and brutality. He was a native of Spain. He was very anti-Semitic. He got his job because he married the empress's granddaughter. Many times he would come to Jerusalem, which was his headquarters, and he would bring with them a bust of the emperor to bother the Jewish people. He did the same thing in bringing shields with the emperor on them. He even had Jewish demonstrators protesting things as they were idolatrous to them, and then he would put his soldiers in plain clothes into the crowd and murder Jewish people. He would raid the temple and take money that was built, that was for the temple and use it to build an aqueduct and water systems for his Roman counterparts. Luke 13 records that Pilate even attacked the Jewish people as they worshipped in the temple. The Jews finally complained, tried to get Pilate impeached, and Pilate was reprimanded by his superiors and ordered to stop taunting the Jewish people. And so when it comes to our story, we see a man who's already concerned about his job, and he knows that if the Jews complain about him to his, his seniors, his officials, he could lose his job. So he, crucif- he crucified Jesus 
not because Jesus was guilty, but simply so he could keep his job. He tried to place the responsibility on the Jews. You judge him. You condemn him. He tried to find a way of, a, a way of escape. He tried to release another prisoner. He tried to compromise. Hey, I'll just beat him a little bit. He even tried an emotional appeal by bringing out Jesus bloody and bruised, guessing they would have sympathy for him. But like, the sh- sh- like, like sharks, the crowds went into a frenzy, and they wanted to Jesus killed. Verse 30. They answered him, if this man wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. So Pilate told them, take him for yourself and judge him according to the law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, they said. They said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, signifying what sort of death he was going to die. You can see Pilate going back and forth here in John 18 and 19, trying to find a way out of murdering Jesus and still save his job. He actually goes in and out seven times, talking with Jesus privately and then to the crowds, trying to work out a deal. He asked them, what charges do you have against this man? See, in order to have anyone killed, at Rome, and anyone killed Rome had to approve. And Pilate quickly realized that they have nothing on Jesus, but something to do with religious laws that he had broken. So Pilate tells them to go away and try him himself. He gives them the approval to kill them themselves, so he could go back to bed and not deal with this, so he could go back to sleep. But they respond shockingly, with it not being lawful to put anyone to death. They want to kill him, but they fear the people, and they don't want to be unclean for Passover. The other Gospels tells us that the crowds made up these fabricated charges that Jesus committed treason because he claimed to be king in opposition to Caesar. They needed to get a political charge against Jesus to put him to death. And the interesting thing was that this charge wasn't even brought up in the Jewish court system. They pulled this accusation out of thin air. Why were they so determined to kill Jesus? One, is that everything that they worked for, their whole life, their reputation as a good person, their position of influence was all going to be lost if Jesus had remained. He threatened their entire works-based salvation plan with his offer of grace and forgiveness. Friends, religious people hate Jesus more than irreligious people do because he threatens to unravel their little towers of babbles that they built for themselves. The other reason was because, as the text says, this was all part of God's divine plan. Their rage at this moment on this soil, at this place in history, is all, all according to the plan of God. Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament to be crucified before, this ever, before there was anything even called a crucifixion before Rome invented it. Jesus was telling everyone this is going to happen, especially his disciples. Over and over in the Gospel of John, you see this. As the serpent is lifted up, so I must be lifted up. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, when I am lifted up, or even more bluntly, he looked at his disciples and says, I am going to be killed. Pilate is stuck. He had presided over countless criminal trials, and every criminal that he saw was innocent. They always took an opportunity to wiggle out of their conviction. No one had spoken so calmly and appeared so innocent as this man. Even his wife has a dream and wakes up and says, let this man go. Pilate pleaded with the crowd three times to ease up, but they refused. The other Gospels tells us that the crowds went into a frenzy and Pilate feared them. Everyone knew that Jesus was innocent. The Father testified to this twice from the sky. John the Baptist said this. The disciples said this. The Romans returned saying no one spoke like this. A Roman soldier at the cross said, surely this was the Son of God. Even the Jewish leaders knew and had to make up a conviction. And Judas tried to return his money saying, I betrayed an innocent man. Pilate is a wreck. He has to find a way to get out of this mess. He may not believe in Jesus, but he is a superstitious Roman who didn't want to offend any gods. And he thought he had the perfect plan. He must have patted himself over the back for this one. You see, there was a custom that at the Passover, the Rome would release to the Jews one of the prisoners they felt was justly justly condemned. This was part of a deal in place with them after being reprimanded by Caesar. And Pilate searched his memory for the most notorious criminal that he could think of. And he thought of someone who would be hands down the worst criminal in society. His name, Barabbas. He was a gang leader 
who had corrupted many of the sons and daughters of these people, led them to their death, killed their relatives, and robbed them re repeatedly. He makes Charles Manson and Jeffrey Dahmer look like Mr. Rogers. Verse 39. You have a custom that I release you to one. I release one to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Why in the world would they want Barabbas? Don't they know what they've done? Barabbas has done already? Jesus was simply a teacher. Barabbas was a murderer. He would kill their children. But in their minds, they're like it would be easier for us to send a legion of soldiers, barricade his home, trap him, squash him, and not let him let go. You can always stop a Barabbas. But how do you stop a man with no guns, no swords, no arsenal, but is shaking the entire world and turning up everything upside down simply by his words? And the only solution was that they had to kill Jesus. He wouldn't be allowed to live. You see, Barabbas may steal a few things from you, even harm you, possibly even kill your loved ones, but he cannot demand everything from you. At least you feel your life is in your own hands. You see, if Barabbas took their life, they would at least rest on their own good lives and their own good works, hoping it was good enough for heaven. But friends, that's the problem. People would rather be exploited, lose a little bit here and there, as long as they have built their lives on stay, as long as what they built their lives on stays, as long as what they did, as long as they did things their own way, they would rather have that than say, all right, Jesus, have my entire life. See, each of the Gospels gives us a little bit more detail into Barabbas. And I believe all of the descriptions are true, but I believe something is being represented here. The Bible is putting forward the most evil, most wicked person who has broken every single command. The worst of men was set free, while the best of men was condemned. My friends, do you see the Gospel? You and I, we are all Barabbas, and we get to go free by faith in Jesus while Jesus is condemned and slaughtered in our place. Imagine what Barabbas heard. He was in a dungeon in a fortress awaiting crucifixion some 1,500 feet away. He would have heard so only the following from the crowds as Pilate asked them if they wanted Jesus or Barabbas. All he would have heard was Barabbas, Barabbas, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. No doubt as he was sitting in that cage, he would have thought, I'm dead. I'm done. He looked down at his hands knowing they're about to be pierced. He's like a prisoner waiting to enter the, the arena to die. And you hear the, the key opening up the lock. You see two men grabbing him by the arm, hoisting him up, and then something strange happens. The chains that held him are being let go. He's being released. He's being shoved out of his prison. And the guards, no doubt unhappy, are saying, get out of here, you scumbag. You're free to go. And I imagine Barabbas walking out into the crowd that's now turned into a mob and making his way through it. And then Barabbas gets a glimpse of Jesus. The man who would die in his place. The man who literally took his cross. He looks around and he sees the mother of Jesus in tears. He sees the crowds in a bloody frenzy. And he looks back up at Jesus and he sees the guards continuing to beat him ruthlessly. It was a lynching he was witnessing. And I imagine... Barabbas catching the eyes of Jesus and following him along with the rest of the crowd all the way to the cross. He may have muttered under his breath, that's my cross. I should have been carrying that cross. I should have been hanging there. I should have died. I should be crucified, not him. Maybe Barabbas thought I'll reform myself I'll take this second chance to prove that I'm a better man. I'll prove to the people that they were right in letting me go. I'll never do those things again. 
And there he'll try to pick himself up by his own bruise traps and stumbling into the death trap of religion, self-righteousness, and sin, the very things that Jesus was dying to set him free from. Friends, you and I will not be changed until we see that we are Barabbas and that there is nothing we can do to reform ourselves. You have to see that Jesus did it all for you, and there is nothing you can do to pay him back. As a matter of fact, it's blasphemous to even try to do so. One writer called this blasphemous anxiety to try to do God's work for him. See, Jesus just wants us to bow down at the cross and weep for joy over what he has done and let that joy change you from the inside out. Lay your deadly doing down, down at the feet of Jesus and stand in him alone, wondrously complete. St. Corinthians says it this way, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As we come to communion this morning, would you replay the scene in your mind? Where do you see yourself in this story? Maybe you are like Peter, full of shame, full of guilt. Would you hear Jesus calling you by name? Would you hear Jesus saying, I'm not done with you? I'm not finished with you. Maybe you've let that guilt and shame put you on the sidelines for so long. You said, I can't be used by God. God will never use me, and even if I tried, God would never bless it. Would you hear Jesus calling you this morning? Would you hear his voice saying, hey, I'm not done with you? Maybe you're a religious leader. You identify with that. You're self-righteous. You're prideful. You come in here saying, I lived a good life. I had a good week. I did so much better things. I'm so much better than that person. Would you let the cross shatter your pride this morning? Would you let it break you where you come, saying there's not anything good in me, but everything that's good in him? Would you come and repent? Maybe you're like Peter, full of fear. Maybe you're like Pilate, full of fear, full of confusion. Maybe you're like one of the people in the crowd, full of conviction, and needing to repent and be saved. Maybe this morning you're like Barabbas, full of joy and tears that you've been set free. Wherever you are today, whatever you're feeling this morning, would you tell it all to Jesus? Would you cast your burdens on him? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you. There are Peters in this room that you're calling by name. There are people in this room that said that you can't use them. They're not good enough. They failed. I thank you that you're calling them by name today. That you've got incredible things in store for them. I thank you that you're breaking hearts full of pride and self-righteousness this morning. People that come in here looking and thinking that they're better than everyone else. But at the cross, we're all sinners. We all need your grace. The person to our left, the person to our right is not better than us, is not worse than us. Without Jesus, we were all condemned to death, but because of Jesus, we have been made sons and daughters of God. Father, would you shatter pride this morning? Would you shatter self-righteousness this morning? Father, I thank you for the pilots in this room that are full of fear and confusion, would your Holy Spirit fill them where they would stand for you no matter what, that they wouldn't be afraid, that they wouldn't be confused. Father, I thank you for that this room is full of Barabbases, people that should have been condemned, people that should have been judged, people that should never have access to you but because Jesus took our place. This morning, we can say Abba. 
we can say, Father, we can say we belong to you and you belong to us. So, Father, as we come to communion this morning, would you work in us? Would you transform us? Would you make us more into the image of our Savior, our Redeemer, our Rescuer? We thank you for Jesus.